So I don't know how long today's lecture is going to take. This could be lecture seven, could be lecture seven slash eight. Don't know. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be fun. So we're going to talk about well, we've already talked about graphical models, but we're going to talk about actual programming languages stuff here a little bit today. Uh, well. I mean, very simple programming language stuff. But for those of you who did okay on the Bayesian stuff, maybe the language stuff is going to be challenging now. Um, uh, oh, yeah, I don't have my chat up here. So, okay. <clears throat> um, nice chat. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is going to be sort of the beginning of the stuff that for people who are unfamiliar with sort of formal languages in the computer science way of, of dealing with expressions and their meaning, um, this is where it's going to going to start to uh, to kick in a little bit. So modulo the first couple of intro lectures. <clears throat> Basically, we're at the end of part one of the course, as it were, right? where we talked about inference being the computational characterization of a conditional probability distribution, basically. And the homework reinforced this by having you do conditioning in about 8 million different ways um, to, to varying degrees of success, but with a huge amount of effort and interest from everyone, which is awesome. <clears throat> um, there are also many algorithms for, for inference. Um, and again, we're going to fo initially focus on sampling algorithms because of their general applicability to probabilistic programming systems. We're going to, we do care about um, stochastic variational inference. And, and we could even just put just, we could just draw a line to this and say we care about variational inference algorithms as well. Um, <clears throat> And they're related, and we'll cover those um, soon enough. So just a couple of, couple of things to say about graphical models and to sort of recapitulate some of the stuff that we've, we've talked about. So graphical models correspond to a subset of probability models. They, you know, they, the, they allow you to visualize the structure of, of a probability model. They're useful for model design and development. They encode certain properties, sometimes explicitly, sometimes via inspection. In particular, conditional independence is something you get from inspection. And the thing that I'm trying to get everybody up to speed on is that you can, you can frame inference and learning in terms of computational operations on the graph. But a couple of things that we need to, to be a little bit more careful about before we go too much further is one, uh, you know, we've done a bunch of, we've done a bunch of Sorry, it's a different different note note taking system. We've done a bunch of um, graphical models at this point, where we have random variables and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but when we consider the 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 distribution of 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 this random variable, uh, it has some parameters, and those are generally speaking computed from the values of the variables above. So there's this thing called a link function, right? So gen more generically in the graphical modeling context, the value of a parent variable may be deterministically transformed in the parameters of, a, of, a, of the distribution of a child. So in the case where you have a, a probability model where you have a mean and a, and a standard deviation term, pretty clearly the link function is a, some vector valued function, but but more to the point, transforms the standard deviation into a variance term in order to plug it into the, the normal uh, probability distribution. We'll, you'll see more examples of this as we go. Anyway, the function that goes from the variables that are parents to the parameters of the distribution of the child is called a link function. <clears throat> we're going to use this term relatively, just ever so slightly differently, which is we're going to call uh, the, fun the function that produces a distribution type object, the link function. So it's going to actually in include this little normal form, this normal probability distribution object at, at the end as well. So a classical example of this, uh, some of you have actually, I know, coded in the class, are linear, deep nonlinear dy dy dynamical systems models. So we all know um, HMMs. And I just want to foreshadow way into the future to talk about sort of like really, really powerful models that are going to come out later in the, in the course, and we're going to be able to deal with them relatively straightforwardly, are if you have the standard HMM um, uh, structure, I don't understand. Kino is weird. Okay. Um, 
So if you have the standard HMM structure that we've uh, we've been looking at, uh, and you have the the probability that the, the the Markov transition probability on the hidden state, the hidden state being a vector in some d-dimensional uh, uh, continuous space, the transition probability of the hidden state here is just normal. It's linear. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's normal with mean that's a linear function of the previous state plus some some uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, diagonal covariance. But uh, this uh, deep nonlinear dynamical systems model kind of thing says, well, wait a second. If we want to really model audio or something crazy like that, what we really want is we want some sort of um, uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on here, and I've just got got, got, got got confused a little bit. This is the standard linear dynamical system here. This is just the the Kalman backbone or whatever. So this is a linear dynamical system in in, in which the the previous state is related to the, the 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 current state via a linear transformation plus a little bit of Gaussian noise. When we look at um, more complicated models like a deep nonlinear nonlinear dynamical systems model, we might wish to have some sort of neural network that actually sits on each of these edges and does a nonlinear transformation of the state. In fact, you might want to have a nonlinear transformation uh, from the latent state to the observed state as well, unless you're going to see again many, many times. But <clears throat> the point here is that the link function from the, the current, from the, the, OK, this is really, really annoying. Um, I apologize. The link function from the the state at z at, at time n minus one or at, at, at n minus one to the current time step might look like two different neural networks eta subscript u whose whose input is z n minus one and some parameter some and to produce the mean of the next uh, uh, Gaussian and the the covariance of the next Gaussian is given by eta subscript sigma, uh, outer product with itself. And this is going to be some other deep neural network that produces a real valued vector. You need to get a low rank approximation to a covariance matrix of the next state. You don't have to understand a deep nonlinear dynamical system model right now. What you need to understand is that there it can be more complicated deterministic operations that, that lie on the edge from uh, any random variable to another random variable in a graphical model. <clears throat> That's the first thing. The second thing is that those uh, link functions can be neural networks that are parameterized. And we can talk about how we're going to potentially learn those sometime. That's totally fine. Uh, but really, the last thing is that we're going to abuse the, link fo the, the name link function, which would typically be, and I'm going to attempt to, uh, to, to draw on this again, uh, the link function would typically be the function that provides the parameter values for the next distribution in the graphical model. So when we're going from here to here, there's a link function which produces the parameter values. When we talk about link functions, we're going to talk about a function which produces this entire, an expression for this entire distribution, including the deterministic operations to produce the, the, the parameter uh, values and some expression that indicates what the actual uh, probability uh, distribution is here, normal. And the whole point of this deep nonlinear dynamical system stuff, which Keynote is irritating the crap out of me that is covering this up half the time, uh, <clears throat> is that these link functions can be extremely complex. And again, this eta, sigma, and I guess eta, mu, are, you know, neural nets with params, uh, theta. Okay, fine. <clears throat> An example of this that you will see when we start talking about comp compiling um, uh, programs to graphical models is uh, are, are link functions that have non-trivial non deterministic expressions. So obviously neural networks are non-trivial de de deterministic expressions. 
but uh, <clears throat> if you look at the this graphical model, uh, and here I'm mixing uh, factor graph and graphical model notation in a way that's acceptable, but um, could be slightly confusing. Uh, the black dot here is meant to, to indicate the link functional in the probabilistic programming sense that we've been talking about. Here we say that Z is governed by Bernoulli uh, 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 0 0.5 uh, distribution. So Z is a probability, right? Uh, or, or rather, sorry, is a, is a, a 0, 1 quantity, right? It's a coin flip. And Y here is normally distributed, and we've done this kind of... Uh, We've looked at this kind of uh, syntax a little bit already, but it's normally distributed if the value of z is zero with mean minus one, otherwise mean one, uh, standard deviation one. Yeah, I'll say that again because I'm sure most if not all of you missed that. So this is a mixture model. Uh, let's say, so if z is one, then y, this will be y, and this is, I guess, p of y. Then y is normally distributed about uh, the value, about mean 1 uh, with standard deviation 1. OK? So this is this says if z is one, then the the mean of this normal distribution is one, and it's at all and its standard deviation is zero. Otherwise, if z equals zero, z equals zero, z equals one, if z equals zero, then the distribution of y is a standard normal centered at uh, minus one. So this is a this is a non-trivial link function, and in fact, this this is the density of a mixture model, right? And it just so happens to have a little control flow expression in here, and that's going to show up um, a couple of times um, in your future. I have a question. Awesome, thank you. I just keep waiting for questions because you know, like I keep throwing stuff out, and then there's no questions, and it's like pointless. Okay, yeah, go on. So in this uh, notation. Is it saying, like, like, so you said that it's saying if z is 1, it's this thing, and if it's 0, it's this other thing. But when I'm looking at it, it looks like it's saying if z is 0, it's centered at negative 1, and if z is any other value, it's centered at 1. That's correct. Okay. But we also know the type mm -hmm. of z because it's a, it's a Bernoulli distributed random variable, and it can only be oh, okay. 1. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Good question. Other questions? Cool. OK. There's a couple of properties that are derivable from graphical models that you should be aware of. We're not, we're not going to really force you to do anything with these. In your homeworks, you might take advantage of this in one instance in order to like, make your life easier. But a couple of, of properties de derivable from graphical models are conditional independencies, which we, you know, I'm going to let you just go off and look at yourself. The concept behind it is deseparation, but the, the critical part is that you can make Gibbs style algorithms more efficient by basically identifying which random variables you need to consider when computing, um, for instance, metropolis within Gibbs ratios. And there are all kinds of uh, marginalization opportunities that can be taken advantage of um, by using basically active paths and uh, to figure out conditional independencies, and you can remove bits of graphical models entirely, and so on and so forth. The critical one that will be helpful to you, or could be helpful to you, depending on how you think about it, is that in a Bayesian network, any graphical model that is, the Markov blanket of a node x is, first of all, this is definition, is a, is a set consisting of the parents, children, and parents of children of x. Okay, So for example, in this particular graphical model, and if we focus on i, the Markov blanket of I are its parents, its children, and the parents of its children. Okay. Now, why is, is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because uh, <clears throat> in a Bayes network, 
or a graphical model, a variable X is conditionally independent of all other variables given as Markov blanket. Okay? And to foreshadow, we're not going to talk about inference state, we're just going to talk about language and sugaring and desugaring and that sort of stuff. Eventually, we're going to talk about general purpose inference algorithms. Uh, you already have, you should be getting the sense at this point, or like hopefully you've gotten it through the homework, and I'll do a little catch up with a couple of you to make sure that it's okay. But while you know, Metropolis Hastings algorithms can work by recomputing the entire joint distribution, probability value in every step. Generic Gibbs sampling algorithms uh, can be more efficient. They might not mix better, but they can be more efficient because if you inspect the graphical structure of the joint distribution, only small subsets of the joint potentials are required to, to be computed for each image update, which is another way of saying that simply by looking at the graph, uh, <clears throat> you know that P of I, uh, like, it, you know, uh, how to say this, how to say this, uh, right, how do I even erase in this? That's going to be crazy. Okay. Um, what, what I mean to say is, is that, uh, when you write down, the acceptance ratio for a metropolis within, within metropolis within Gibbs uh, update, for instance, you know that you need to sample from the conditional distribution of i here if we're going to use this, given everything else. But the Markov blanket statement says that i is conditionally independent of everything except for its Markov blanket, which means that. In the joint distribution that you write down, you know that you only have to ever consider uh, the terms p of i given e, p of uh, l given i, p of l given i and j, da, 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 p of you know k given i and h, and literally everything else is is conditionally independent. So you can write immediately, you can figure out what the Markov blanket is and basically what variables you have, values you have to consider when you're writing a Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Just to point this out, if it isn't already obvious how, how this kind of works out, um, if, if you, and obviously there's, you know, I guess we're looking at I star, we're used to this notation, so I'll put I star here. So those are the only terms of the joint that you need to consider, right? I'll also point out that those are the only terms out of all of the terms in the joint distribution which involve i <laughs> in any way at all, right? All the other terms would just cancel out when you're writing a metropolis within Gibbs step for i. I have another question. Awesome, great, thank you, wonderful. How come m doesn't come in because it is it depends on I, but up a couple levels. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, because we're going to say this is given these values. Okay, so we're assuming that those values are given, and if you're gonna, if you know about deep separation and all that sort of stuff, you, the, all the active paths are blocked here, right? So it's it's this uh, 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 the conditional independent statement is. That variable is conditionally independent of all others given, and we should like a nice way of saying this, given the values of all the random variables in its Markov blanket. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So just to sort of get you start starting to think, like, I mean, the, the pain of homework one was to make sure that you were A, willing to put up with the pain of, of doing this, B, had, had the understanding of what's going on with probability models and conditioning and that sort of stuff. Uh, and, but C, really, to the, to, to the point of, like, deriving all of these inference algorithms by hand is utterly hideously horrible, right? So, like, being able to automate this would be super, super cool, okay? So we're going to talk about how to automate this, so you never have to do that ever again. And and if you decide to do it, you can use any of the languages that are out there to do it, and you don't ever have to think about doing that operation stuff again. Okay, that's good. Um, I just have a question. Um, why do we Ryan, have to? I... Why do you have to include L given I star and L given I star J? If you're given J, why do you have to like? Uh, I've forgotten which one of. Uh... 
oh, uh, this is the explaining away thing, right? So uh, in, in general, in, in this shape, right, when you have edges into, and this is, again, stuff I, I'm, you know, next year, if I have to, I'll, I'll teach all this, but this year you should just look it up. Uh, and we, I gave some hints in the lecture I think you were not, not here on. But basically, this variable becomes conditionally dependent on this variable when this variable is observed. Sure, but they're both observed. That's fine. I can look it up myself. No worries. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying, what I'm saying, <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that because this is observed and this is observed, the the distribution of this is conditionally dependent on 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 this variable over here. That explains L given i j. Yeah, but not L given just i, or i given. Oh, L. Oh, I see. Oh, okay, never mind. The conditions are flipped. Okay, never mind. Yeah, exactly. Cool. <clears throat> All right. Awesome. Perfect place for, for questions. <laughs> We've had a couple. Are there more? Mia? No? Naomi? Namrata? Yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. Narada, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you can go back to the graph. Yeah. Uh, right. So will the uh, uh, will we have to include terms h given d? Here. Uh, yes. No, that's not in the Markov blanket. Okay. So just uh, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so h does not. So all the terms in the Markov blanket, if they're being con there in the uh, how do I put it the left side of the conditioning they're being conditioned on and that they, we don't have to include them it's just whenever I is being is literally it? this is the definition of a Markov blanket now I, I can make it a little bit clearer this is immediate parents of children of X okay this I'm I'm, I'm this is like I'm trying to uh, use uh, a, a a thing that uh, some other lecturers do here, which is to sort of like give you just a little bit more after we've talked about graphical models and to just to keep it, you know, like the, you know, uh, uh, keep it in your head. This is none of this is necessary. I'm I'm uh, I'm saying I'm saying that it, you should be aware that there are there's an entire textbook. Uh, by one of the smartest people in machine learning, Daphne Kohler and Nir Friedman. What's it called? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, probabilistic graphical models, right? Like, here's the deal. <clears throat> I have to pick and choose a little bit. There's probabilistic graphical models. Okay, we can we could do probabilistic graphical models the entire time. This is a prob prog course. We need to actually get the programming language just a little bit. But there's a billion zillion properties that you can derive about graphical models in said book, and those properties are necessary to do sort of advanced computationally efficient things and to design super awesome general purpose inference algorithms. You may choose to encounter those or in, in, engage with those things later on when you think about projects or whatever. But this one is one that's simple enough, right? There's a Markov blanket. It allows you to basically take what we've talked about, which is Metropolis Hastings within Gibbs. It's something you're going to do it in homework number three in a general purpose way and recognize that you can be faster computationally by just doing a little gra local graph search around uh, uh, the graphical model node that you're trying to update in the Gibbs step to find its Markov blanket. And the Markov blanket is defined as it is right here. And that means that you can evaluate fewer terms of the joint probability distribution. And you know exactly which ones you should evaluate because of the graphical structure that you will have. OK? Somebody ask a question about what I just said, because that, that part is important. That, that's, that's cool. It's, un, it's not necessary, but it's like a, a it, it can be a, sort of a a poly time uh, speed up, kind of like a, a, a like an asymptotically significant speed up in 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 your inference algorithm. I have a question that's kind of related. I awesome. Guess. 
Um, so when you had the, the ratio that you computed, normally it's like the condition on everything else, like probability of I star condition everything else. Yep. And you just replace those with the joint. Is that always like a good approach? Is that always going to be easier to compute the joint than the conditional? Is, or is that like just in certain cases? Yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's not always easier, but okay. So I, this, this, this is, this is, this, okay. I'll just repeat it. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> What does it mean to be conditionally independent, right? You've got P of A, you know, you've got A, you got random variables A, B, and C. And I say that A is conditionally independent of B given C. Okay, that means that I can that I can write P of A, you know, uh, P of A uh, given B and C, and that is P of A given C. That's what it means, right? You're just like you can forget B straight away. Okay. And that means this is proportional to P of A and C and that's it. You don't ever have to think about B, which means that in a model like this, where you would, you know, if you're going to do Metropolis within Gibbs on I, you would, you know, you could <laughs> write down every term P of A, P of B, P of C, times da, 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 every single term. And then every time you do a metropolis step within, you know, within one of the Gibbs kernels, you evaluate every single term. That would be really silly because you know, thanks to the Markov blanket, that I is conditionally independent of A, B, C, F, G, H, and H. You just don't even have to think about them. You never have to con consider those terms. But the question is, and the, what I want to get you thinking about is how in, you know, heaven's name, can you figure out, given some expression of a probability model, what the Markov blanket is? I'm going to give you a mathematical expression or program expression. How would you actually automate figuring out what the Markov blankets are such that you can evaluate the right terms in the joint distribution such that your Metropolis within Gibbs algorithm that you de 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 develop completely, you know, generically actually does the right thing? So that's the kind of thing that I want to start getting you to think about, like, how do we express these probability models? Then how do we compute using those expressions? And then what algorithms do we run on the derived structured representation? Payment, you had a question as well? Yeah, I was typing it. Uh, the, the P of L given I term is kind of bugging me, the example. Okay. No, the one you had written on the on the slide. I want to make sure, like, am I? Oh, did, okay. I, I probably actually screwed that up. Uh, did I write P of L given I? Yeah, that shouldn't be. There's no P of L given I. Yeah. Okay. That's my question as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, no, no, nothing intended. Just that Ryan asked the same thing, and I got confused. No, it's, it's the, like. Look, I'm dealing with with keynote note taking, which means that I can't actually see the, the the letters on the graphical model just the same as you. Like, there's nothing I can see that you can't see, uh, and it's uh, the most annoying note taking. It's not as good as the other one. Okay. Anyway, uh, Oops. so yes, thank you. That term shouldn't be there because, of course, it doesn't make sense. Okay, thank you both. Okay. Okay. Cool. And this actually kind of nicely gets us to something that we could spend a long time talking about, actually, right? So how do we write down anything? What does math mean? Like, I mean, Emma has been driven crazy, and I suspect other people have as well, with, with like the total pandemonium of my random notation that like switches from one slide to the next and doesn't make any sense and isn't consistent and is like Kevin Murphy's textbook all over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I understand. I'm there. I'm right. I'm right there with you. Okay. But there's a method to the madness, which is, which is to say that like, okay, this and you know, ugh. okay. I'm going to stop using a, a keynote at some point. This is really, really, really irritating. Uh, this here is accepted mathematical notation. 
And I think that some of you, like in particular, I think Mia has like really struggled with his notation. Like what has, you know, what the heck does this mean, right? And for a computer scientist, this notation is crazy making, right? It, like it, it means a bunch of stuff. So what does it mean? What is, what is it, uh, chime in, what does that mean? What does X t twiddle beta alpha beta mean? Does Don't be shy. Mean the probability of X equals beta of alpha beta. <laughs> so, like you know, the, what's, what's the, the probability chances. density function like for a beta like, distribution? It's, you know, P, of, so it, it, this implies that P of X given alpha and beta, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is equal to whatever the, 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 you know, it's one of gamma of alpha times gamma of beta over gamma of alpha plus beta times something or other. Is that right? I don't even remember. It doesn't really matter. Tell me if I get it wrong. I think this is wrong. <laughs> I didn't remember whether that's uh, in the exponent or did not. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, this is the sort of thing I used to have memorized, but now I realize I don't need to have it memorized and I just look it up every time. Uh, I wasn't so far off. I just got it uh, in, inverted. That's that's not bad. Okay, x to the alpha uh, minus one, one minus x to the uh, beta minus one. Okay, cool. All right. So it, it implies that. Yeah. What else does it imply? If you want to get a value of the thing on the left, you should sample from the distribution specified by the thing on the right. Yeah, so it, it implies there exists some procedure for generating a sample distributed according to given density. So this is, this is weird, right? For a computer scientist, this notation actually means that this thing is an object. Is it gone? Uh, uh, that this thing is an object with two methods, sample and log prob or a score, whatever. Okay, so straight away, even mathematical notation is totally, totally overloaded, right? There's like two things that are going on here, right? Same thing with this. Bernoulli says that there's some probability density function, and in this particular case, a, a you know, uh, uh, yep, yeah. uh, <clears throat> and there's some ability to, <laughs> there's some procedure for sampling from it. So, um, and the procedure for sampling from a Bernoulli distribution is one that, that like, uh, I think you could probably write. In fact, I know that Adam actually did in his homework by sampling from the, the cumulative, you know, the inverse cumulative distribution function. So we know how to do that. But sampling from the beta, hmm, that's actually not so easy, right? How do you sample from a beta distribution? Can't you do rejection sampling? Oh, you, know, you can do any of the things that we just talked about, but how do you get an exact sample? Just something to think about. We're going to return to this later. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, there will be procedures that we can write to sample from these fundamental distributions. Uh, maybe I missed it, but does the, the inverse CDF with uniform distribution trick not work here? Or? Uh, it's uh, not clear that the CDF for the beta distribution is in closed form. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it is not actually. So you would look up a Knuth algorithm for sampling from a beta distribution and 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 go with it. Um, 
<laughs> there's also a trick you would basically treat it as a Dirichlet and uh, with two two parameters or one free parameter in the Dirichlet you you do using a trick uh, with uh, the order statistics of a bunch of gamma distribution. It's a it's gross. I, I just want you to think about it, okay? Um, and recognize that the, that it's not obvious how to write the exact sampling method, right? It's not even really obvious how to write down the probability density function, right? Well, we'll talk about that in just 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 a little bit. That's like uh, the only person that I would trust in the course. Well, that's not true. Not the only person, but based on it would it would be some competition between Emma and Naomi to get the normalization constant integrals right. Um, <laughs> Right, or at least attempt them, right? So, how, it, like writing down the probability density function means that you have to integrate that that nasty beta beta likelihood, right? Um, and that's you know what you know, like the normalization, you know, z uh, alpha beta, you know, is in this particular case, what is it? Uh, x to the what is it again? Uh, beta minus one uh, uh, x to the uh, one, yeah, crap, one minus x to the beta minus one. At, Okay, have fun, right? So there's a couple of hard things in here, right? One is to score, you have to normalize. And the other one is you have to have some procedure for sampling, okay? And that is true for any one of these distributions, okay? And at the end of the day, just to be clear, probabilistic programs denote distributions, okay? And at the end of the day, we're going to be trying to figure out two things. One is how to sample from them. And if we're really, really awesome and we get beyond sort of where we would normally get in a broad, broad course and, and we start getting into research topics, um, we want to be able to compute that quantity, okay? Uh, and, and use it for scoring. And that's not easy in general, okay? But right now we're, I'm, I'm letting myself, you know, do my, do my connectionist thing. So, <clears throat> uh, so we have the mathematical denotation which we've just discovered is actually overloaded and means a couple of things and is very confusing until you realize that it actually means two different things and everybody just accepts that as the way it is, right? Then there's the graphical model thing, which arguably makes things uh, better, different, I don't know. Uh, it's, it says the same thing, but, it, but now you can see at least the graphical linkages and, and by, you know, the, 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 you know, work of our foremothers and forefathers, we can derive algorithms that tell us something about the structure of the probability model based on the graphical structure, okay? And we're not gonna, again, stress that too much, but that's something you should know. This course <clears throat> uh, is about being a little bit more formal about what we're uh, writing down and what it means um, using notation that's, uh, well, different, right? Uh, it's programming languages notation, okay? So <clears throat> this same model, the X is distributed beta alpha beta and Y is distributed Bernoulli X, you know, modulo the fact that I'm using Roman letters rather than, 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 than Greek letters here uh, is the same. So, so in the language that we've talked about, modulo two operations, which are, are or two special forms, which are new, this says, let there be a prior, which is a distribution typed object, B beta A B. So a distribution typed object, well, you know what a type is. It's an int, it's an object, it's a whatever, like it's going to have things that you can pass it. You know, there are, there are gonna be functions that require distribution type objects in order to, to, to work. One of them will be sample and the other one will be observe. But you can pass around distribution objects just like they're um, just like an int or a float, right? Here we say that x is a sample from the prior. Okay, uh, and this prior distribution. Uh, another way, if you're uncomfortable with uh, functional programming and are more familiar with ob uh, object-oriented programming, you can think about this as uh, as an object again. Uh, where there's a method sample that you can you can you can pull off the uh, a sample right. This likelihood is also a distribution type object, right? and here's a data point, right? and we observe given a distribution a value y. 
<coughs> and here, also implicitly in this kind of notation, you're supposed to know, as I've demonstrated somewhat confusingly in, for the first part of the course, that in this particular setup, the thing that you are interested in inferring is the posterior distribution of x. You're just supposed to know that. In particular, it becomes obvious in the graphical representation because at least we say that we observe y there. Over here, this program very explicitly says exactly what you observe, and the program explicitly represents what the posterior distribution is over. And here it's going to be over the return value of the program. In this particular case, the return value of this program is simply the value of x, which is the posterior probability, which is the posterior distribution over the parameter x, or the, the probability of the coin flip. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Please. Could you um, maybe just re-explain this like sentence as a whole? Because I didn't understand why the x is the posterior, like especially with this syntax. Um, so I haven't explained. So like I'm, I, I'm like doing uh, doing the thing where I give you something in advance. I haven't explained to you how to to interpret this expression, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to start leaking in a little bit of prop program, and then we're going to get formal about it, right? So, so I'm leaking this in and just read it. So there's a there's a there's a distribution type. Cool. There's a di there's a distribution type object beta a b. That's a prior distribution. That's this thing right here. X is a sample from that prior. That's this thing right here, also this thing right here. Right? There's a likelihood, which is Bernoulli. That's this thing right here, also this thing right here. And then there's an observation Y, which is this value right here, and it's given. There's actually a value. The value of Y is one. So this is like, you can read it like mathematics. Let these four things take these values. Then, observe under the likelihood, which is to say, basically, it, it literally observe, like fill in the gray bit in the graphical model, observe under the likelihood the value y, and the return value, the thing that we want uh, the, the posterior distribution of, is the value of x. So this program denotes p of x given y, and is equivalent to this, and is equivalent to that. So the things in the square brackets is just like four pairings. So yep, we'll get we'll get to that. Gonna, data. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, thanks. So there's a bunch of languages, and we could go into a lot of a lot of time and talk about this. And I've haven't updated this since the 2020s. There's a whole bunch more of them that should be in here: Jin, Turing, Pyro, Pyprob. A little embarrassing that I haven't updated this one. I've done I've done it on some other slides, but I, those are talk slides and these are teaching slides. So there's a bunch of stuff in here, and I think there's even some stuff in in stats. But basically, the idea of of formalizing probability uh, graphical models and probability models in terms of programming languages uh, and their semantics has been around for a long time, and operationalizing them through various generic inference algorithms has been around for a long time. Typically, statistics is focused on um, uh, 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 finite variable cardinality models, in other words, graphical models. Uh, more recently, Stan has focused on, on models that are, uh, that are continuous, basically. We'll talk about what that means in a little while. Machine learning has, talked, has basically sort of uh, gone from uh, Lisp, Lisp style models to deep uh, deep generative model style models. Uh, so uh, um, mixed continuous uh, and discrete random variables, uh, unbounded control flow, that sort of thing. AI has been mostly about counting. That's at least it's like uh, uh, David Poole's kind of kind of area. And then the programming languages community is, has some really interesting. Um, interesting languages that are actually basically built on counting as well because they don't understand how to deal with continuous random variables. The most popular languages um, uh, out there um, are, there's a bunch of them. So there's, if you're gonna write down, so like 
if you're going to actually use the languages that we talk about, if you're going to do graphical modeling inference, uh, you should use Stan or Bugs. Those are the those are the things. If you're going to do factor graphs, you should use Factory or Infer.net, probably Infer.net. Uh, if you're going to do infinite dimensional parameter space models, basically if you're going to do research in probabilistic programming, then you probably want to use something like Web People or Anglican or maybe Pyro now. Um, and if you want to do unsupervised deep learning, then you would use Pyro or ProbTorch or, or Edward, something like that. The first part of the course, this, this, this part of the course that we're in right now, we'll talk about finite random variable cardinality languages, which include the languages in red. So the stuff we're going to talk about basically explains what's going on uh, or we'll explain what's going on in graphical models, factor graphs, uh, and in um, unsupervised deep learning, uh, languages for unsupervised deep learning that um, are reposed on TensorFlow, not TensorFlow Eager or Eager TensorFlow or whatever they call it. So to kind of warm you up again for what's about to come, uh, let's look at bugs and try to read this program together. So we want to, again, the goal is to formalize graphical models, right? Uh, <clears throat> so this is a bugs model. Uh, the model class that bugs is capable of expressing are finite graphical models. And generally speaking, inference is sampling based and they do Gibbs sampling of the sort that we're, we've talked about with the uh, kind of automatic uh, Markov blanket determination and some automatic raw localization, conjugate family kind of stuff. Automatic, automated. So in the bugs language, you write down a model like so. X, hey, there's our favorite overloaded symbol, tilde, which is uh, you know, normally distributed with mean and standard deviation. And then there's, they actually have control flow for i equals 1 to n. Y sub i is distributed uh, uh, normally with mean x and some uh, precision. And outside the program, there's a data block where the values of some of the random variables are bound. So these are unbound or free variables. Notice that n is unbound and y is unbound, and they need to be specified outside of the program somehow. So there's a block that binds the values of the free variables. n is given the value 2, and y is given a vector value with first entry 9 and second entry 8. Now, if you look at this, uh, uh, you will see that there are one, two, three random variables, two of which, because they're bound externally, have known values, one of which is not, um, uh, is not, is only involved in control flow. It's not, uh, not, not observed. Okay. So can everybody read this program? The question is, what does this program mean? Sorry, is the C um, in the graphical model the same as the C? Is it just like multiple? Uh, no, sorry, sorry. The, the C is literally a, a, a vector constructor in bugs. It just says like constant, basically constant array. And that's part of the graphical model? It's not part of the graphical model. It has nothing to do with that C. Sorry, C, okay. C in, in this case is uh, 1 half, and uh, A is 1, and B is 1 fifth. So what's can the meaning we, of this program? Sorry, yeah. Can we access X from this program? Because it seems like this is what it's kind of computing, like the posterior posterior distribution, right? Oh, lovely. I love it. It's great. Yes. So this is P of X given Y1 equals 9 and Y2 equals 8. That is the meaning of this program. They're the same. I shouldn't do. Okay. And that means that this program corresponds to some distribution. So we really want to be able to do two things from this. We want to be able to sample from it because it's a distribution. And we'd like to be able to score or compute the log problem. Same, same they those two mean those two mean the same thing. Quick, quick question, is it possible in this particular case to actually do this? I see somebody nodding slightly. 
I see most of you not, 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 not nodding. Ryan, come on, I saw you nodding. Well, I mean, the distributions are pretty simple, so you can evaluate the probability, the likelihood, I guess. Like you can mm. normalize it. This is saying I can I actually comp had... compute this probability. Yeah, I just had a question about how, like I mostly was just like <laughs> this thinking. Is very wonderful. That's good, yeah, go on, yeah. Um, so this, like this code seems to give me all the information I need to like it describes like i see that this describes that graphical model um like it implies this posterior but i don't see how this is like like don't you need another like actual distribution to explicitly sh tell you the posterior like none the posterior distribution isn't any of these like explicitly constructed distributions right are you saying this oh, the, whole code? This is the posture. This program, that's is what I'm trying to get at. This program is P of X given Y1, Y2. That is the denotation for that pro that 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 posterior distribution. If you wanted to specify that probability distribution, that's the way you would write it down. But the command that uh, calls the box program to compute the posterior is missing, right? We're not we're we're not talking about how to evaluate this yet. We're talking about how to okay, because it, it will have more variables, and we wanted to compute something that is even before or like x and w for example if we wanted the probability of w given y for example and not x uh, like x is still a random variable right it's... i'm saying that this like it's this is like, these are actually good things to be thinking about i'm trying to get mm -hmm. you to think about a couple of things that are difficult to talk about without like actually talking in this way right <clears throat> when i write down beta one one I don't care what this the name of this thing is, right? <clears throat> this is just a denotation of some distribution, right? Similarly, this is this bugs program is just the denotation of some distribution, right? It happens to have a free variable, and that indicates what the posterior distribution is over. It indicates what the distribution is over, and what if you were to evaluate that, what you would return when you sample. Right. So back to the earlier question, would you be able to actually com compute the score for this in this graphical model? It's related to the first homework, very related to the first homework. Yeah, because it's um, Gaussian Gaussian, right? So you can analytically yeah. Gaussian prior to Gaussian likelihood. So you can you can actually compute the posterior distribution in closed form for this. This would be normal, you know, x with some mean and some standard deviation, which you could you could derive from whatever, okay? By the way, cool. is um, n not supposed to be in the graphical model? Uh, it should just be a plate, right? That's right. Here, it's just a plate. Oh, but we didn't specify n, but I guess that's okay. We did specify n's right here. It's bound outside. Oh, I see, I see. That's weird that you can denote random variable value as a plate, but okay. But we'll get to it. Okay, you're 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 thinking in the right direction. Okay, so let's <laughs> let's do this one. Oh. Okay. Oh, was question. another question? Yeah, yeah. question. Great. Yeah. So, I have two questions actually. First is, looking at that snippet of code, I don't see how you can get x from these like if you specify y how x comes out because it looks to me like it flows from like we sample x and then given x we sample y so does like if you were to actually call this to solve it does it reverse it in some way yes yes, <laughs> yes. we are entering the state of maximum confusion which we need <laughs> to go through in order to make it to the beginning of understanding 
Yes. In fact, I forgot to say something that I always say when I talk about this, and, and I want Mia to think about this, right, or, or to, to comment, and I don't mean to call out people, well, you know, I do mean to call out people, but um, uh, I don't mean to pigeonhole people into programming languages, people and mathematicians and whatever, so we're all going to learn all this together. I think the first thing that we should think about is, what does it mean when you write down a program, right? It is almost impossible for all of us who are not necessarily computer scientists to look at this and not think about the execution of the program. Right? I want to, just like all of you, want to read this program as I generate a value from x and then I generate some, some values of y given x and then what the heck? <laughs> right? There's another way of thinking about uh, um, of executing this program, and you know, again, this is, you know, you can think about this as, as a data structure construction algorithm. Please construct a node X, and then please construct two nodes Y, linking them through a link function to the previously established node X. And that's all it does. So, but that still constructs X first. Uh, it doesn't construct X, it constructs a, a, a node. It constructs a node. Okay. In other words, this can be a graphical model specification language that when you interpret it, you don't actually generate a value X, you generate a graph node. So it's just building the graph. It's not saying we're picking one first or the other. This is just the hierarchy of the graph. Neither. It is denoted. So this is the state of maximum confusion. You can look at it either way. What you're thinking about and all of you are thinking about is how to evaluate the program. And what I'm trying to get you to do is to think about what the program means, what the semantics of the program are. And we'll get to semantics in a little bit, but I want you to realize that there is actually a difference between how you execute the program, whatever it, whatever it means to execute the program, and what the program means. And I see Nomrata is about to, uh, to, to jump in with something awesome, I'm sure, right? So what I'm saying is that this program denotes the posterior distribution over its free variables, and its only free variable is x. So instead of y, if I would have mentioned x to be something outside the block, then will it calculate probability of y given that x so if you said if you if you put x here and you bound it to some var vari yeah, variable instead of y the y is not uh, it's not bounded anymore but x is yeah okay so if you put x in here and you say it's 7 or whatever yes then this would be the posterior distribution of the two y values given the value of x which in this particular case would be pretty clearly because of this be separated from everything else and these would just be normally distributed with in this particular case mean seven and and precision one half good question and so my second question was what is log prob what does that mean oh sorry it means that it means Google. evaluate the, the 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 probability density function or probability distribution function but in general, we're never going to actually work in like PDF or PMF land. We're going to work in log PDF or log PMF land. So, uh, and just, just as a force of habit, I write down log prob. So it's basically whatever the density function is, just take the log of it. I have a question. Um, if we didn't specify Y outside, then would, just, would this be the joint? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. We're starting to move, <laughs> move through the state of maximum confusion into oh. yes. Okay. Great. And payment. Uh, yeah. It, this in in bugs. It just so if you were to go off and actually put this code into bugs and try to match it up with other code, they use precisions rather than means and variances uh, or standard deviations. Like whenever you write down what the value when you whenever you define formally the semantics of a normal distribution, you have to decide whether the arguments are standard deviation, <laughs> variance, or precision, right? Like, you got to choose that. But yes, Naomi, back to you. This, if you didn't have the value of y's bound, then this would be the joint distribution. 
Correct. Okay. I wasn't sure based on your response if you were saying yes, or you were saying, oh, you're very confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, I generally don't celebrate confusion. I mean, I guess I, I, guess I did bit, before. So, yeah. <laughs> But like when you have to move through it, that's, you know, that, 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 that's fair. OK, OK, let's look at this one. So this is another probabilistic programming language that you could actually go out and play with and use for whatever application you want. This is STAND, which, which denotes finite dimensional differentiable distributions. OK, and we'll talk through what that differentiable distribution thing is. Here I've done something horrible and actually not showed you the um, the 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 binding block, but I'm going to tell you now that these variables, just like in, in, in bugs, are bound externally. The values are bound externally. So what is, what is this model? Note that this, you can already start to see some history of probabilistic programming here because Stan looks a heck of a lot like bugs because the Stan people decided to make bugs a better language, and then all the statisticians started using Stan because it's faster and better than bugs. Yeah, uh, Payman? Payman, I know, given your research, that you should know immediately what this, this model is. Yeah, I posted it in the thing. You did? I see. It sounds like you're just kind of, hmm. It's HMM. <laughs> Uh, uh, it is an HMM, but that's true of lots and lots of models. But I want to be a little bit more specific than that. Specific? Yeah. Naomi, I'm going to go no with linear regression. It's OK. Is it uh, filtering? Well, I mean, while payment is thinking, Let's look at this. So we have parameters. It's a parameter block, the real x's, right? And I realize that we're about to lose the p break. Are you going to be OK without a p slash eat break today, Emma? Because it's, well, it doesn't feel like it's happening. Yeah. I mean, it's, I've only got 21 minutes. If we take it now, it's kind of silly. I, I apologize. Uh, so <clears throat> um, we've got some x's. Let's just let's look. Let's evaluate this program. We've got x1 is normal. 0, 1, and then we have for t equals 2 to t, x t, x 3, x 4, is normally distributed with mean a times the previous value of x and some variance q. And then for t equals 1 to t, you have some, oh, no, no, stop. God darn it. It's really. You have some y's, which I said were bound, which are normally distributed with mean x and variance 1. OK? So I said these, are, these values are bound, so all the val y values are known. What does this program denote? This whole thing. This whole thing is the joint posterior distribution of all of the x's given the y's. And it's close to Payman's answer, but actually the difference is extremely important. This program denotes a Kalman smoother. So this is a, a linear dynamical system or a Kalman smoother in which you want the joint posterior distribution over the entire latent state trajectory. Okay. And you can see how, for instance, if you wanted to do inference in a linear dynamical system, Using a, using a uh, language like Stan, it's incredibly easy to specify and incredibly easy to put the data into. So you have a modular representation of this posterior distribution. Questions about is this it one? Typical, is it yeah. typical for the um, initial hidden state to also have an observation? 
doesn't matter. The way this, okay. How useful is a background and control theory for these linear system stuff? Uh, there is a relationship. You're not going to need it for this. However, for those of you who are interested in controls, um, uh, I'm very strongly considering making the homework number seven a beautiful model predictive control uh, problem, which you'll be able to solve in I don't know, seven or eight lines of code. Once you know what's going on, okay. Because you can t you can frame model predictive control as as inference, no problem. So all the tools that we're talking about, if you're doing model predictive control or control in general, straight up inference. We'll have at least one lecture on that later on in the term. Okay. So the goal here is to, to is the joint. This is the vector here, the, the joint posterior distribution given y. There are a bunch of language restri restrictions with stand. No, there are bounded loops, no discrete random variables. Model class is very small. It's finite dimensional differentiable distributions. But the inference techniques that they use because of these restrictions are very powerful. It will they do uh, Hamilton and Monte Carlo using reverse mode automatic differentiation and black box variational inference, both of which we'll cover. I won't go into too much detail about this, but I'll just say that if you have a particular model that's well expressible as a factor graph and computer vision or natural language processing tasks quite often fall into this, um, provided you can write down your model as a finite composition of factors, then factoring and infer.net are languages that you can use to write down, for instance, conditional random fields or a true skill model or something like that. And again, one of the, one of the largest prog prog deployments out there in the real world is the uh, player matching system in Xbox Live. Um, so when you you know go to battle against your online friends, your uh, opposing teammates are picked using infer.net, uh, doing inference in a very, very large factor graph, basically computing a true skill model, which is cool. Uh, and there are deep probabilistic programming languages. We're going to come back to these um, later on in the term. <clears throat> and to foreshadow, we're going to go in the next next part of the term. Uh, we're, we'll talk about languages that open up. So all the languages we talked about right now are restricted, and they're like finite dimensional parameter spaces. When you do the programming language, the standard programming languages thing, and op, and introduce unbounded, you know, co complex control flow, then you immediately launch yourself into infinite dimensional parameter space models, and you have to develop inference algorithms for those, uh, that gets um, relatively nasty, uh, but fun. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. I think I already did the um, regression function example application of where you might want a dynamic co computation graph model. We'll come back to this. We'll do it again later on. Don't have to worry about that. So. We're going to get to uh, you know five years ago on the state of probabilistic programming really fast now. So, and yeah, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to look at restricted languages that correspond to easier inference problems, which means that inference can be relatively fast. Um, it means that you can't write down some of the models you might want to. You get a fixed computation graph, and then we're going to talk about unrestricted programming languages later and the complications that arise from those. Okay. Uh, I was going to do, uh, okay, uh, I'll come back and do the demo at the end um, uh, if people care, but uh, this is the model we were looking at. But what I want to get to is the beginning of part two, just a little bit, just to get it into your, to get it into your head. And we're going to start with a language. And we'll probably spend the rest of the time talking about the language because I'm guessing that for some of you, this is going to be kind of new. In fact, we might even just stop on this slide, okay? Uh, but uh, I have a feeling that amongst uh, amongst the several of us, Adam and Mia probably could just like explain this right now, ha looking at this because they 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 know the form of grammars. That would be my guess. Um, but let's look at this and and see what it means. So we're going to talk about for the first bit of the class and the first I think one, two, three, the next three homeworks we're going to be talking about first order probabilistic programming languages. In particular, the one from the book. Please read chapter two. Clarity comes there, intuition comes here. That's that's the way. That's the most effective way. Um, great. So, 
when you write down a uh, formal language, you can you first thing write down a grammar so you can you say what expressions are allowable in the language. Okay, so this grammar tells you what expressions are allowable in the language. Okay, and you can read it in lots of different ways. Um, uh, this is a recursive definition. Okay, and that's just the way it is. So suck it up. Uh, you should start here. And what this says is that a program, or basically a denotation of a distribution, in particular a denotation of a posterior distribution, can start with either an E or a form def in F, V, 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 E, followed by a Q. And note there's a Q here. So in other words, basically it says that you can write a, write a program that consists of a bunch of function definitions, a bunch of function definitions, recursively, and then a body. Okay. And an E can be replaced with a constant, a constant value or primitive operation, a variable name, or any one of a bunch of special forms, basically. Right. So there's a let expression, an if expression, a function application, where the f is one of the functions that were, or procedure application, I should say, a procedure application where the f is one of the procedures that were defined above, uh, or a primitive function application, where each of the e's, and this is a, a little bit of a notational thing that's that 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 um, you should get used to. Each of these e's can be re recursively replaced by an E expression. Okay. Then there are the two probabilistic programming forms, which uh, are basically the subject of this course. Sample from some with with E, so you can rewrite inside there an E, and observe, which also take expressions, which can be rewritten. Okay. So this language is not Python. It's not Julia. Sorry, Adam. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it is a language, right? It's uh, a Lisp-like language uh, whose syntax is stolen from Clojure because it has slightly better syntax and slightly better naming, but it's basically a Lisp. But you can think about this as basically being a, a, an abstract syntax tree of an intermediate re representation language or something like that if you don't like functional programming or Lisp, and you can think about writing in some other language and then compiling it to this. But this, this language was very carefully defined because uh, if you'll notice, there's, there are no looping constructs, there are no recursive constructs, so on and so forth. Okay, which means that, uh, as you will see, all evaluations, all programs that you can write will evaluate to graphical models. Okay. So carefully defined design language that allow you to interpret a program, and that means transform it in some way uh, into a graphical model. Okay, so let's do a couple examples just to just to you know. Uh, get you thinking, right? Uh, so we can do a program that looks like this. We can do def in uh, plus. Uh, we get to put variable names here, a, b, and we can have this return plus a, b. So plus is going to be, for instance, a primitive operation. So what does primitive mean? It means that it is defined in some implementing language on whose values or semantics we understand. Okay, so I don't think the the meaning of plus is uh, in question yet. Although I think uh, uh, the one of the programming languages people that I that I know proudly exclaims or explains that he 
uh, believes that he's made it through to the point of maximum con useful confusion when people in the PL course start to question what the value of the symbol seven is. <laughs> right? So seven denotes something. It is a symbol, and you can assign its meaning to be whatever you want it to be. Right? So we're going to use you know, normal uh, uh, interpretations or meanings assigned to symbols like seven and plus, but you should realize that those are literally defined in a, in a stack of definitions all the way back to Bertrand and Russell, basically, okay? Fine, so we've defined a function, we can define, you know, minus to be, you know, AB of minus AB, okay? These are functions, and then we can say, you know, let x be sample normal one one, y sample normal one two, uh, z be uh, plus x y. Observe normal z. One seventeen. Can uh, I ask a question? Damn it. Uh, why? Uh huh? Yeah. Uh, is a function is different from a procedure? Uh, a procedure. Yeah. <clears throat> No, we're going to say that a, a procedure is a function whose definition is provided in this language. Okay. So the all the, the first three items are like provided like building blocks in a way. Are you talking about these three items here? V, yeah. V and F? Yeah. So V is going to be a variable. So it, it, it'll be, you know, whatever. It, a, a, B, they're, they're symbols. Basically, you can think of these as being symbols. They're, they're variable names. So they're not provided, but they're the set of variable names that are allowable, right? There's going to be basically any string, right? Up modulo some restrictions, like you probably shouldn't name a variable let or if or sample or observe or something like that. That would be not a very good idea, right? Uh, C's, yes, those are going to be symbols or expressions whose values are known in an underlying implementing language. So the value, the, the, you know, the Unicode, Unicode char character seven, we agree means seven items of something, right? And the, the Unicode char character plus means, you know, addition in the mathematical sense, right? Mm -hmm. Great, and procedures are different than primitive operations. So primitive operations are functions that are opaque. In other words, you don't know how they're implemented, mm -hmm. right? But Whose, whose, whose action in an underlying implementation language is agreed. So again, plus would be an example of that. So the, the symbol plus corresponds to a function that when given two arguments does what we expect it to. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and then the procedures are, it's just a word to, to, to distinguish, are functions that are specified in this language. Okay. But notably, these functions can have sample and observe in them, whereas, uh, and I haven't stated it yet, but it will be it will become apparent in a little bit. The, we will assume that the underlying language is purely deterministic. There are no, there's no stochasticity in the underlying language whatsoever. So there's no sample, no randin, no whatever. All stochasticity happens at this level, none below. So the only place that you can have sample or observe are in the body of in the main body of the program or inside one of the expressions inside one of the procedures excuse me does a procedure always say let first or no this i just i just made a procedure right here so this is a this this define. so f is the procedure uh name the variables are all variable names. So these are A and B here. Mm -hmm. And then the body is an E. And I expanded the body at, in this form right here, which was a primitive operation, uh, 
with two E's and those E's, E1 and E2 in this particular case, expanded out to be variable names. Okay. Okay. And just to throw it out there to really warp your brains straight away, when you start talking about like doing uh, like program synthesis, which is one of the things that's super cool in probabilistic programming, you can imagine writing a generative model of said programs by attaching probabilities to each of these rules. So there's a go between between a, between grammars, which allow unboundedly long constructions, and probabilistic grammars, which allow which automatically uh, short, put a prior over the space of of possible expressions, preferring short programs. So like a Kolmogorov complexity kind of thing. So when we talk about doing program synthesis, one way to do it is literally to write programs that generate programs using this syntax. Pretty cool. Okay, so you can ask for very easily the posterior distribution over programs. <laughs> Weird. Okay. And there's reason to do that. Not least of which, it's in, that's what's inside of Excel, right? The, the, that little flash fills feature, that's actually what it does. It does inference over programs, okay? So when you think about like, why the heck has nobody ever copied Excel and had it uh, operate, it's these little features that seem really beautiful and intuitive, but actually have like 50 years of crazy research behind it, like expanding out, like sliding to the right. Oh, that's, that's crazy when you think about what's actually happening. Okay. Let's look at a couple example programs and then call it quits for the day. Uh, what's this program? I should stop doing that. That's annoying. I guess the first question is: It is is it valid under the under the 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 syntax syntax that we had before? I don't remember what observe does with two arguments. It takes the first distribution argument, and we're going to, it will be very explicit about this, but there's a distribution, that's the distribution, and this is the value that is bound to the output of that distribution. So another thing, we, uh, we fill in the graphical model and say that that value, a value from that distribution is observed. Payment. I guess to be fair, I should really ask Naomi to chime in. Are you waiting for me to say something? I'm Sorry. waiting for somebody to say what the uh, what this program means. I was a bit zoned out. But yeah, that's I, why. That's also why I called on you just to uh, to humiliate you for looking at your phone instead of listening to me. Linear did, regression. Thanks, Greg. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were waiting to to, to tell if it's valid because it looks valid, but then you know. <laughs> something hidden. <laughs> it, is, it is valid. So, so uh, sorry. So, yeah, linear regression. I mean, the 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 names of the variables are pretty are pretty uh, uh, in, indicative, right? So, there's slope. I'll just call that M to make it easier. B, right? So, you've got M and B. These are sampled from some prior, and then we call a procedure observed data with parameters slope and intercept and then we have some value and some other values so what are oh, they're interpreted as x and y values or input and output values and we have a we let the value fx be you know time slope x plus intercept so that gives you basically a an estimate we'll call this you know fx it's whatever right and we observe a normally distributed quantity about this mean uh, with standard deviation one 
given value y, okay? And we call this observed data one, two, three, four, five times. So in other words, in the in data space, we have x, y pairs, one, two, three, four, five. We have five pairs, right, of data. And what we're after is what is the, what, what this means is what's the posterior distribution over the slope and intercept in a graphical model in which there are five observations. Is this some um, normal linear regression or Bayesian linear regression? What's the difference? Hmm. Well, Bayesian this it Bayesian linear regression describes the posterior over like possible functions, right? Correct. So what is this then? Uh, Bayesian linear regression? <laughs> Bayesian linear regression, right? So this is the posterior, this program denotes the posterior distribution, the joint posterior distribution of W and B given the, the values of X and Y and the values of X and Y are here. Just as a quick little thing, how would you do posterior predictive inference in such a program? Wow, your least favorite. So, so by the way, just to, just to throw it out there, like this program you could put, put into almost any probabilistic programming system uh, and solve your homework one problems like done, no issue, right? It, we've just written down the thing and now we're gonna do general purpose inference in it, right? So how would you do posterior predictive inference? You can take some samples from this distribution and you can, but you can also just write it in the, in the program. So you can write at the very end, instead of this, you would put another little thing in this, in this vector and say sample, uh, uh, what is the noise distribution here? It's that sample, you know, uh, uh, plus times slope X, what do we call it? X hat, I guess, or X new or whatever. Uh, intercept one. And now we have joint posterior predictive inference. I can tell all of you are like, I've had enough. I don't want any more of this. My brain is about to blow up. Okay. Uh, we'll leave it at that. And I'll just say that um, this, for a programming languages person, in particular, these ones right here are super ugly, right? We don't want to have like nested let, 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 let. So we're going to introduce a concept called sugar, and then we're going to you know, like talk about desugaring. Uh, which are some things that you'll want to know about in terms of programming languages. And it'll give you a, a thing to think about re while reading chapter two of the book. Uh, so uh, questions, comments, um, we'll pick up here next time. I have a question about awesome. the homework. About the second homework or the first homework? The second homework. Great. That's awesome. Um, well, not that I've looked at it, but <laughs> <laughs> that makes your question somewhat less awesome in advance, just to be clear. <laughs> I don't want to get your hopes up too much. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, go on. Uh, you said before that the first homework was to be done individually, but then mentioned something about groups for the uh, homeworks after that. Yeah, so uh, you should still do the homeworks individually. In other words, you should actually do them yourselves, but you you should pick people that, like just talk, like I, the first one. I really wanted to know what you individually knew. Now I want you to 
you know, basically I want you to each do the work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I want you to ju just talk amongst you, like just figure stuff out. I'm not interested in like, like competitively judging one of you against the other of you or whatever, right? That, that's like totally not the point. Um, the, my, I will check to make sure that you know what's going on and you're actually getting it. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, you know, I, I, there's having looked at the, having looked at the homeworks, there is an, there is a, uh, and this is the reason why I actually did it again. I like it basically have never graded anything here at UBC, but I thought I'd do it in this particular case. There's really a very fascinating split. Everybody is really strong now. Like, let's be, let's be honest. Like everybody is ridiculously strong. I'm very impressed. So this is going to be good. Okay. But there are clearly some, some, some strengths that are, that are different between people. So you might find somebody who's really good, you know, Emma, in your case, you might find somebody who's really good at programming languages, right? <laughs> uh, or, or somebody who's really, really good at Bayesian inference already, right? And to be fair, I think everybody who's in my group, uh, that you should put your hand up just so you know uh, what's, what, what's going on. Put your hands up, everybody in my group. Come on, Jason, put your hand up. Okay, all right, there you go. All right, so all of these people theoretically should know a fair amount about Bayesian inference, right? They, none of them are going to know about programming languages, people. How many of you actually know about, about, how many of you know about programming languages? Put your hands up. Mia, Adam, I'm guessing. Okay. Well, all right. <laughs> so I'm just guessing that those two are going to be uh, the, 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 the resources there. And, you know, uh, in terms of like correctness and just mad horse, like work your butt off, everybody else should put up their hands, right? So like that's that's awesome, right? Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be one person. Talk to multiple people. Get to know people in the class. It, it, it's the that's that's the that's the main point. I, I do have the ability to. I guess on Piazza you have the ability to reach out to one another. But it's a small enough group that we could even just distribute an email list or get a, a Slack thing. But Piazza's the way to go, probably. So, yeah. Thanks. Yep. And the second homework, by the way, is totally different than the first homework. It's really like, do you know how to evaluate a, a, a programming language? Like the, the language we just talked about, your, the task of homework two is to build a forward evaluator. So in the manner that you were thinking about earlier, right? what you need to be able to do is reduce expressions in this language into expressions, symbols, or values in some other language that you understand. So you'll be given an expression like, you know, plus 17.6, and your evaluator should be able to tell me what the value of that is. You'll be given an expression like sample beta one one, and your evaluator should tell me what the value of that is. And note that there's a little bit of an issue here because the value of that will be a set of samples. So if we're on this slide and we're over class time anyways, can I just ask like kind of a uh, annoying question like there's this grammar um on this slide it doesn't guarantee you have like a valid program right like at all not even close what do you mean like you'd have to do some sort like you'd have to make some sort of guarantees for example about the values of like in the last line and the q line v1 through n and e um like you need the first value of the if, like the first expression can't be just like a value or like a variable that's not a Boolean. <laughs> you will have some degrees of freedom in how you interpret these expressions. However, you're right, there is not a type system here. This is not a typed language. We're not talking about doing any sort of type inference here whatsoever. And indeed you can write nonsensical programs very easily. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. So um, 
for those of you who are programming languages people or whatever, you'll get to know the symbol bottom. It's possible that it's very easy to write programs whose value is bottom, which is to say it has no, it's like it doesn't complete. It fails. Yes. So the space of meanings will have to include something like uh, did not compute. More questions? Comments? Can I ask about the uh, bugs in Sten? Yeah. There was, uh, it. at least I, I can tell from the screen that it doesn't seem like it has a return value. Does that mean that the posterior that that describes is is just a posterior over all latent variables? Is it is it that simple, or is it just that? Like, is there some more meaning to that? I don't know. Uh, so the there is a return value, <laughs> in some sense. It is the value of the program. Right, is the the we will talk about exactly how to evaluate like we we have to so this is a syntax we haven't ascribed a semantics to it we will ascribe a semantics to it we'll do it also I, I don't know that we'll go through in lecture the formal semantics of, of it it's a little bit uh, we'll we'll we will definitely do operational semantics um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, you know in this particular case the return value is y and that is the that is the free variable in this program. In this in this program, um, the return value is the last is the is this tuple here at the end, this slope intercept, right? Uh, and for very simple programs, the value of the pro the you know sorry, uh, the value <laughs> I do not understand. Um, the value of the program is you know this is a totally valid program. This is a valid program. So the value of the program, when you reduce the, the, the expression, it becomes something. Like when you translate the program through evaluation or whatever, it becomes something, right? And the thing that it becomes is a distribution. This happens to be a Dirac distribution on the value 8. This happens to be a Dirac distribution on the value 17. This program... happens to be a Dirac valued program on the distribution normal 117. This program is the distribution the, uh, is the set of samples. It's a, it's it, the, the, the meaning of this will be a set of samples, basically. A, 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 a forever sequence of samples. So in those earlier languages, it's just important that you're sort of, you know, like whatever value comes or like if you want to describe a posterior or a particular value, you, you sort of make sure that that is the variable that comes out last, I guess. Is that is that the practical sort of way to think about this? Uh, yes, but in the grammar, the only, like, again, we'll, we'll talk about what it is, but like, there's only two ways of doing it. You either write an expression like this, or you put a let binding there. And the, the meaning of the let binding is whatever thing is, is, is here. Or the if is either the co the consequent or the alternative. We'll, we'll 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 go through the semantics very in an annoying amount of detail um, while you're working on homework two and three. Yeah. But the next one is fun. If you haven't ever written an evaluator, like writing an evaluator, you will find uh, a. a troublesome, but then ultimately intellectually very satisfying exercise. <laughs> More questions, comments, worries? Okay, we're getting there. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, great. Uh, you mentioned that we can uh, write programs that generate programs. Uh, yes. Is this used in practice ever? Like I can imagine where you might want to learn, let's say, 
heuristics for optimization problems? Or is it simply just intractable to try and learn heuristics this way? Uh, um, Kevin Leighton Brown right now has explicitly engaged with us and I've done a very bad job of engaging back to do basically <laughs> this. Yeah, so it's something that you can think about doing for sure. Thank you. Not easy, not easy, yes, but okay. yeah. More? Come on, now. I, mean, I know you've got something. I can see it. You're just, you know, you're, you know. Yeah. Let's see if we heard from everybody today. I think, yeah, I think, I think everybody except for Tony said something. Yeah, it's great. All right. If there's nothing else. It was lovely to see all of you. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday, confusing you more. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers.